Hey everyone, here it is, episode seven of Crime After Crime. And just to give everyone a warning, you might hear some beeping in the background because I am almost completely snowed in right now and there are trucks coming <laughs> trying to rescue me. And with yes. me as always is my partner in crime, Danielle. Hello. And for once, it's not me setting the fire alarm off cooking. <laughs> so I just wanted to note that because I know my husband's listening and he'll be very proud. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. No fire alarm and uh, no dog barking and <laughs> no motorcycle driving by your window. We've had all kinds yep. of fun. I know we have. In it's recording. been great. <laughs> yeah. In recording this show. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on another episode of Crime After Crime. Uh, as we get started today, we need to make a slight change to the topic. Now, originally, we were looking at most dangerous elderly criminal. And as we started researching it, for me personally, it was pulling my search into things that we're a little down and kind of sad in terms of the stories. Uh, you know, one of the ones that kind of immediately sprung to my mind was this horrible occurrence that happened in Santa Monica, California, where yep. uh, you had an old man that was driving and basically drove onto uh, a section. It, I've been down there a lot of times, and I know it does look like a road, but it's not. And it is essentially this big giant walkway. And uh, he wound up killing and injuring many, many people. And we didn't feel like that was quite the the best way to take this episode, so we did just a little tweak, and the topic is now most unbelievable elderly criminal. Well, I think we kind of went into that subject not knowing what to expect, and it, you're right. The second I started getting into my research, I mean, I probably went through 30 Google pages, and my jaw was on the floor the entire time. I don't know if it was my particular ter search terms I was using or... I don't know what it was, but I was stumbling across probably some of the most horrific crimes, like things that I wouldn't normally even be talking, comfortable talking about on my channel, um, wow. which was not necessarily something I was expecting. So I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised and pleased that you had said something when I was going to say something to you. You were like, you know what, maybe we should change this to most unbelievable yeah. uh, because I was, I was struggling. I was about to wave my white flag and you went ahead and did it. So. I, I learned so much though. Um, I, I didn't realize that this is kind of a problem that is growing and we're going to include some research for you guys so that you get to understand that with us as well. Um, but before we get to that, if you want to vote on this episode of Crime After Crime, be sure to follow us on Twitter at Crime After Pod, and you can vote there for seven days after the episode drops or... You guys can also vote on YouTube. We have been through seven months of figuring this out, you guys, and I think we finally have it. Yes. <laughs> um, as always, I'm going to put a timestamp just in case still for you to go to the direct moment at the end of this podcast, if you're on the YouTube version, to vote. There will be a little I up in the right-hand corner, but I also learned that any moment in the video, whether you are on mobile devices or if you're on a laptop, you're able to click the video and it will automatically pop up. Or if you're on a computer, you can just kind of hover your mouse over. It will always pop up no matter what time. You guys can vote. If you you know have already decided in the midst of my story that you just love it, even though John hasn't gone yet, you can go ahead and vote for me. <laughs> or you can wait till the end to make things fair. Wow, that would be but, super convenient. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you can it's it's very easy. So last time I know we were trying to figure out with the mobile version how you can get the eye to come up whenever. You just hold your finger over the video and that thing will pop up for you. So hopefully we have finally figured out how to vote on YouTube successfully. Yeah, and it seems like at least some of you have figured it out because we have our results, voting results with Danielle. We need an intro song for this section, by the <laughs> I way. I know, <laughs> we really do, except I'm probably gonna end up making it a sad one because, because again, John, you guys, whooped my butt and I knew it. He has brought it to the table the past couple of videos on Twitter. I had 38% of the votes. John had 62%. And on YouTube, I had 27% of the votes and John had 72. So again, he blew the sucker out of the water. So here I am again, the cup goes straight to him, even though he's had it so many times, <laughs> tradition to hand Thank it on over you. to him. There it is. I've got the cup. What did you make for me this time? Mint tea. 
Oh, is that Bacardi in there? Nice. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Again, just like the time before, could be poison. I don't know. I'm yeah, not going to give yeah. anything away. But <laughs> Who knows? Maybe in year two, we'll change it to Bacardi and crime after crime. I don't know. Exactly. Sponsored by Bacardi. Um, <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I just want to give a very big, I have to give a speech now. So um, everyone, <laughs> thank you for <laughs> voting. Uh, and everyone that voted for me, thank you. Thank you. You get two thank yous. Uh, I really appreciate it. I, I just feel like I've been lucky in terms of finding stories about super interesting people. I mean, evil Elmo, who knew that there was this guy and his backstory and it's scary and it's dark and it's wrapped up in red fuzz. I mean, who knew it was, it was really, really crazy, but that's part of the fun that I have in terms of doing this show. He's not necessarily the type of person I would cover on uh, the Lord and Arts channel or on brain scratch, but Hey, this is crime after crime. This is what we do. Um, exactly. And I appreciate it when you win because it pushes me even harder. And I love that because I am one that loves to research and, you know, something I take pride in. And you're always someone that I've looked up to in that aspect. So every time you win, I'm like, that's it. I'm going John this week and I just <laughs> go for it. <laughs> I really do. And it pushes me out of my shell. So even though it, it's a little stingy when you win. Oh. Uh, it No, uh, you know, I'm just messing around with you, but I still learn a lot from it and I love it. So No, I do too. Awesome. And I, I think it's an important part of the show because of that. It's only going to make us better. It's only going to make these episodes better, but it really, uh, some of the most intense research that I do nowadays, I mean, yes, an episode of Brain Scratch or an episode of Searchlight is intense research. Um, but for some reason on these particular stories, I really, really dig in and I really reach and try yeah. to get details, um, in a bit of a different way. So I can feel it too. I think the competitive thing is actually helping and I'm it sure, does. yeah, it ripples across all the work that we do. So, uh, I appreciate it. And what is this three now? Is this a three? Yes, this is. It's a three P. This Ooh. is your third one. But man, I have come for blood this week. I am ready. I did a lot of researching and I'm proud. So I'm I'm ready this week. I've brought an unbelievable elderly criminals. Uh, plural. Oh, 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 I'm oh, here. Oh. I'm here for this. <laughs> I've only got one, but man, she's going to be tough. She's going <laughs> to be tough. All right. So before we get into the stories, uh, let's share some information that I did find uh, just learning about this topic. The elderly, elderly population is increasing dramatically. By 2030, about 72.1 million Americans will be over the age of 65. That's over twice as many elderly people as there were in the year 2000. With that, elderly crime is also on the rise. And according to data collected by the FBI, the crime rate is pretty much matching the population increase step for step. In the year 2000, about 58,500 Americans over the age of 65 were arrested. By 2013, that had increased 44% to 84,415 arrests of senior citizens. That's insanity. But it, I mean, if you think about it, it really makes sense. Yeah. I mean, if you have, you know, one in every hundred people that's going to commit a crime and that population is growing, of course, the number of crimes is going to increase as well. But what are these people doing? Well, according to craftelderlaw.com, the five most common crimes committed by seniors are kidnapping and usually not of strangers. Most of those charges have to do with taking a grandchild against the parent's wishes. That is something that I actually stumbled across as well. And it shocked me. I don't know why it shocked me because when I was doing my research, that's actually majority of what I was seeing. Um, but you just wouldn't expect that. I feel like there's kind of this vibe that goes with elderly criminals or just, you know, the elderly in general that they you know, they're too old to do these things. That's what everyone's always saying. And that's usually what their defense is trying to say when they're going through this. But that's just not the case. <laughs> they're going to shock everybody every time. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's that's an interesting aspect to talk about because you have the appearance of someone being elderly and uh, maybe you'll think that they're less likely to commit a crime or they're less likely to be violent or you shouldn't really have to be too afraid of them things of that nature, just based purely on their appearance. It's weird because I almost felt like this, you know, kidnapping being one of these topics almost felt like kind of stereotypical or something like, oh yeah, it's yeah. a grandma trying to take their grants. And, you know, 
Um, so I'm trying to not fall into that. But as you're going to see, as we go through these lists, they do these, you know, yeah. some of these actually fit. The next one is shoplifting. Uh, who's going to stop the elderly person who looks like your grandparent and asks them, you know, and then ask them to empty their pockets if they're heading out the front of the store? Um, harassment. As people get older, they tend to get more opinionated and vocal, which um, I know I've seen in my family. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've seen in myself, and I'm still only 26 years old, so yeah. I feel bad for anybody around me later on in life. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have hit and runs, which I've actually joked with you about before. That in, I know in my retirement, yeah. that's what I'm looking forward to: just really slow speed, low impact. <laughs> Hopefully, no one's getting hurt, but you know, just kind of grinding my car against the parked car and then just continuing down the road. Oh man. Um, and, but to, to the point of what they're saying on this website, many hit and runs occur because the senior citizen doesn't even realize that they hit something and then they wind up leaving the scene. Oh, absolutely. I've seen actually multiple instances of that in my family. <laughs> you, I'm being serious and you don't think you wouldn't think, Yeah. you know, you really wouldn't, but yeah. I mean, eh, I can prove it. <laughs> well, it happens. And I've, in my family, you know, we've had uh, a couple people that have lived into very, very late years and I haven't really found a good mechanism for um, them losing their driver's license, surprisingly which is kind of interesting to me. There should be some type of, like the tests should be more frequent. Uh, oh, absolutely. But there's just, there's just not really much. Yeah. In most cases, at least within my family, it is, there is a close family member that finally gets concerned enough that they kind of step up and talk to the person and say, look, you're past the point of driving and we'll make sure that you can get around because, you know, Uncle Jim is going to take you uh, to yeah. bingo or whatever. But um, there's just, there doesn't seem to be any, um, you know, state or city level type of intervention to really help with. Um, there's there's a time where you're not going to be able to do that. I know that. <laughs> will, oh, yeah. I, will I admit it when I'm that age? Mm, no. That's the question. <laughs> Apparently not, based on what I'm seeing. Uh, and kind of related to that reckless driving, uh, thanks to deteriorating eyesight and lack of fine motor skills, a large portion of seniors can be dangerous drivers. And that doesn't include the ones that are doing it on purpose. Yeah, which I'm sure there's plenty of those as well. But it's the same thing, you know, obviously you have to have your eyes checked, but if you're only having your license renewed, you know, how how many years do you have? I mean, so much can change. I know my yeah. eyesight changes in a year. Yeah. And they're not going to they're not going to know that and oftentimes you don't even realize. So Yeah, and it's yeah. different from state to state and sometimes it's just like a mail renewal. Um yeah, so it's it's I really wish that there was some better better rules around that. Uh, while those five are somewhat easy to believe and possibly, possibly even understandable, we have other types of crimes that you might not expect from your grandmother or grandfather. There are drug deals, bank holdups, embezzlement, nothing seems to be off the table. And that's why here we are today with our episode, Most Unbelievable Elderly Criminal. And here is Danielle with her story. Now, I was very, very pleased that we changed this to most unbelievable because I had this story on my list of possible, you know, final, final stories. And the second John said unbelievable, I was like, yep, I'm ready for it. And just like he said, nothing seems off the table. And this is one of those cases that's going to have your jaw on the floor. So this is a story about four elderly men that did something that shocked an entire community and threatened majority of the American government. 75-year-old Frederick Thomas, 69-year-old Dan Roberts, 58-year-old Ray Adams, and 70-year-old Samuel Crump were your typical group of American elderly men from a small mountain town in Georgia. They had the routines. They had their regular meetups at the Waffle House for breakfast. They drank their coffee. They had their biscuits. They ran their mouths. And it seemed like they were innocent, run-of-the-mill guys. Mr. Thomas himself was the leader of the group, which wasn't all too surprising because he was actually a Navy veteran. And Mr. Adams had worked for the Federal Department of Agriculture for growing crops. And he was, you know, just an incredibly kind guy. He was known for being friends with everybody, even to a fault. Mr. Roberts, Roberts was a Vietnam War veteran. And Mr. Crump just seemed like an average Joe, basically. And he actually had helped doing maintenance at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So while they seemed like average guys and their wives and their neighbors, 
all thought the absolute most of them, they had a secret that nobody saw coming. And not just because the secret's crazy, but because of their age and what exactly they were trying to do. So in 2011, these men were plotting to attack the government. Mr. Thomas and Mr. Roberts' knowledge of the military, combined with Mr. Adams' knowledge of agriculture and Mr. Crump's knowledge of the Center for Disease Control, they actually planned to blow up government buildings and kill masses of people using poison derived from castor beans. Whoa. <laughs> yes. Whoa. <laughs> I told you, unbelievable. And we're only at the beginning of the story. Wow. So I am not exactly sure how the government got tipped off to their plan. Um, I was not able to find that anywhere, which I found incredibly odd. But I do know that they decided to send an informant out to see what exactly these men were up to. And this informant was a man named Joe Sims that had been in jail in South Carolina for horrific things I'm not even going to get into. But he actually approached the FBI and wanted to help with terrorism threats. So when he was let out on bond, they sent him straight to these men to befriend them. So between March and October of 2011... Joe met up with a group of men many, many times at the local Waffle House and Mr. Thomas's home, and he started recording their conversations. Mr. Thomas told Joe that they were basing their attack off of a book that a right-wing militia member had written. And this man, I cannot remember his name for the life of me and didn't want to call him out, um, but he also was a Fox News commentator. And I guess he published this book, and it was almost like a call to arms. Uh -oh. So it was exactly, it was basically about a group of people attacking the government because they were tired of how things were being run. So Mr. Thomas went on and on about how the people in the government buildings were the first that needed to go. He had actually created an entire bucket list, as he called it, of who they wanted to hit. And this included judges, IRS personnel, federal employees, politicians, all people that he believed needed to be gone to make the country right again. And he said, and I quote, there is no way for us as militiamen to save this country and to save Georgia without doing something highly, highly illegal. Murder. So they wow. each basically had their part in this plot based off of all their previous work experience. So by May, Mr. Thomas had actually gone down to Atlanta multiple times to survey the buildings that house the Internal Revenue Service and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. And while he was plotting a way to blow up these government buildings, uh, Mr. Crump and Mr. Adams were trying to figure out the poisonous beans with hopes of producing 10 pounds of poison. Um, so basically, the poison that they would derive is incredibly dangerous, and it's a substance that can be introduced in multiple undetected ways, which makes it so terrifying. It can be released into the air, into food, into water, but they planned to basically let cars do it for them. They planned to extract this poison from the bean and they were going to go and start throwing poison out of the car window as they drove along highways. What along the in <laughs> Exactly. They were going to fling these, you know, bean I don't even know how to describe it. It's just so unbelievable. And they were going to throw it out of the car all along the eastern seaboard, all the way down to New Orleans. And they planned to hit massive places. This was not just like local government. They were going to hit Washington and Atlanta and Jacksonville. And they figured when they threw this out onto the highway, other cars were going to drive through the poison and they were going to transfer it to other places and right. water pick it up and it would get in the water system. And that would just distribute the poison even further. In another recorded conversation, Mr. Thomas and Mr. Roberts actually met up with an undercover agent and they agreed to buy a silencer, a bomb, and the parts to convert a semi-automatic rifle to a fully automatic machine gun. So at this point, they weren't just plans, talking plans and meetings and Waffle House. They were really starting to act out and piece together their terrorist attack. But this is so, like almost a group suicide pact. I mean, this is just so strange. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And Mr. Thomas, again, he was he was very, very into this. And every single meeting that they would have, he would basically hype everybody up. And right. he would say over and over again, you know, he'd make sure, you know, is everyone committed to this? You know, he would, they would all bring their guns out and be like, all right, you know, this is how you need to use your gun. And these are the people that we need to hit. And you can't be scared of dying. And we've got to go in there because we've got to fix the country and we've got to fix Georgia. So 
every single meeting, I mean, he was, he was going with it. It wasn't just fun talk. He was pushing it as far as he could. So while, you know, authorities at this point were looking into them, the FBI had this informant, they knew that successfully extracting the poison out of the beans was incredibly difficult to pull off. And they're seeing these elderly men and their 70s and late 60s, and they're thinking, you know, there's no way they can pull this plot off, but they don't want to underestimate the men, like a lot of people would, sure. you know, typically do. Yeah. Uh, and they knew that so far the men had gathered two of the main ingredients to make the poison, but they were having issues with a third ingredient known as red devil lye. And it was the last ingredient that they would have needed. So when Mr. Adams himself agreed to make the lie on his own, authorities realized at this point they were way too close to successfully making this poison. They kept waiting for their age or something to hold them back. Right. Um, and it just wasn't happening. So in November of 2011, the men's homes were raided and they were taken into custody. And authorities found so much within every single one of their homes. They each had caches of firearms, f firearms that are not necessary for most people to have. They yeah. found ingredients to make the poison. They found these illegal explosives and the community was just in shock. Their neighbors had absolutely no idea what these men had been up to. Um, the bean actually grows on a bush and a few of the men had actually gifted these bushes to their neighbors. Just, it's like they were trying to really throw everybody off. Uh, and then the people at Waffle House had no idea that these meetings had actually been going on right under their nose while these men had enjoyed their morning coffee. Now, their defense was that they only had these beans to fight off moles. What? Appar <laughs> apparently... It's a typical thing in this region of Georgia f to use these beans as encouraging moles to not dig up your property. And oh, okay. that's kind of how they found out about this poison and this bean um, and how they planned on basically backing themselves. And I mean, they covered themselves up. Remember how I said they gifted it to neighbors? Mm -hmm. They were trying to do everything they could to look innocent and shrug it off. They said, you know, it's an ornamental bush and it looks nice. And they pretty much all denied that they were trying to make a poison out of the bean and attack the government. And, you know, they also shrugged off the uh, talk at Waffle House, claiming that it was nothing serious. And their lawyer actually came forward and said that it's typical for older men, especially those that have been in law enforcement, military, to get together and talk crap about the government. So that might be true. That, yeah. I, I could see that. That would be true. But what I'm bothered by is, first of all, the plans that you're talking about aren't really focused on targeting. I mean, you're saying they had some type of planning of a hit list of particular government officials, but then the plan about making these beam bombs and throwing them outside of car windows, you're not controlling who the target is at that point. And outside of all that, you're invalidating America. You're exactly. invalidating that those the government is that way because of the processes that this country is built on. So are you trying to say that we shouldn't be democratic? Like what, what I, I just don't I don't get the overall message. I get they're unhappy. I get oh, they're absolutely. angry. Yeah. Uh, and I'm so glad that law enforcement acted on this because it wasn't really going to be about the bean bomb. Uh, no. They would have acted out in probably some other way if they would have even gotten to the point of being just frustrated with the bomb and say, well, we can't do that, but we still have our list and we have all these weapons and we have these other explosives. So let's just go ahead with that part of the plan. Um, no, but they were, I mean, but they, they were going with it. And it was interesting because I cannot remember specifically, but I know that Mr. Thomas at one point was recorded saying that he one of the people they were almost framing it behind had done some sort of attack like this. And I think it was Kansas and I cannot remember his name, mm. but they were actually critiquing it saying they were upset that he had harmed children. So that was another thing that was getting to me. You know, you're, you are going to feel bad enough for children to not do this, but you're still going to drive along the whole entire East coast with this poison. Right. And, you know, I can understand the whole, you know, people get together and talk crap about the government. That's not anything that's that not typical. Sure. But then they just started going into deeper holes of excuses that you knew. They started saying, oh, well, we were just 
exercising free speech and <laughs> um, they right. kept denying it. But authorities had tested a beaker that had been found in one of the homes and they had positively started to extract the poison. Wow. It tested positive. So that combined with the damning records of their plans that they had, they had all those recordings. I mean, they bought a silencer yeah. and a bomb and all these things from an undercover agent. Uh, they really, it really dismissed pretty much any of their excuses. So in 2012, Dan Roberts and Frederick Thomas ended up pleading guilty. They pled guilty to conspiring to get an unregistered explosive and an illegal gun silencer. And they ended up being sentenced five years in prison. Uh, and then in 2014, Adams and Crump were found guilty of conspiring to make the poison to be used as a weapon and possessing a biological toxin because they had, in fact, yeah. been able to extract some. And they received 10 years in prison for that. And it was interesting because the neighbors, some of them at first were defined. They said, absolutely not. These, they're our old sweet neighbors and they right. wouldn't do that. There's absolutely no way they were a part of the military. You know, these men, a couple of them had trouble walking. Uh, I mean, in court in a lot of their hearings, they had to have assistance. And then also a lot of them had trouble hearing. <laughs> so even while they were in court as well, I mean, they were cupping their ears, things had to be said multiple times. They just, no one ever would have guessed it. And a lot of the neighbors did. They stood strong with these men and they said, there's absolutely no way they wouldn't do that. They're 70 some years old. They would never have been capable of it. And the family, some of the family members of them as well, some of their wives stuck beside them and said, no, there's no way, despite all of this evidence. And it wasn't just talk. They had gone out and acted it out. They had, yeah. you know, canvassed buildings. Yeah. They had successfully extracted this poison. They had you know, gathered parts for a bomb and to make a, you know, a weapon. Yep. And it was just bad. And despite all these people strongly standing beside them at first, when the judge asked them to their faces, would you use these weapons to hurt federal employees? They said, yes. Ugh. So they clearly, they had a plan that they would have carried out regardless. And, you know, unfortunately, they had supporters for a very, very long time simply because of their age. Wow. Wow. Man, that is just mind blowing. My my brain is just racing in all kinds of different directions. First of all, if they did carry out this master plan, how was it going to end? And I think that's where we get to them talking about having all these weapons and all this because they knew someone's going to come after you. you can, oh, absolutely. You're, you're never going to wipe out enough of the government that there isn't going to be law enforcement or armed forces or some other means of people coming after you. So that's where I, I talked about it. Like this is a group deciding that they're going to commit mass suicide and they're basically going to take a bunch of people out before they go. And what happened to these guys in their lives to, to leave them in that type of mindset? These guys went and defended this country, but then they want to disassemble what they defended. And even outside of that, talking about people that are just complaining about something in particular, let's, let's imagine the scenario that they got away with it, that they took out all these people that in government they thought were bad and they got away with it. You really think that they're going to stop complaining at that point? Exactly. This is, it's so weird to me that people don't realize this is what they love doing. If they didn't have that to focus on, they'd be complaining about something else. It, it's their energy and their intent that is making that happen. It really has very little to do with the outside influence of whatever's happening in the government. These guys should have been playing on a golf course. Exactly. And just complaining about the government while they're shooting 18 holes. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, a lot of people actually tried to pin it, especially some of the family members on Joe Sims, the informant. They said that because I'm pretty sure Joe was a lot younger. I never was able to find his age, but a yeah. lot of people said they encouraged it or that he encouraged it. But from all the information that I saw, I mean, again, they said straight to the judge's face. Yes, we would have used those to hurt federal employees. Yes, we would have carried this out regardless. And uh, some of the quotes that I was seeing, there were way too many to include in here from mm. Mr. Thomas himself. I mean, he, wow, yeah. he was set, man. Like he kept saying, I mean, he just, he was not scared of death. He was not scared of death. He was not scared. He knew he would go in there 
and do what he could. He was prepared for that. Right. He was prepared to be one of the first people in there. And he, it's just, it's frightening. It's very, very frightening. And I can, I can get that people really wanted to say, oh, well, Joe was pushing it. Um, but to me, it's very obvious they had huge issues with the government and they would have, again, carried it out regardless. Um, but, oh man, it's, it's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the other thing for is there's people that, you know, didn't like the time we were in before our current president. There's people that don't like the time that we're in with our current president. One thing that is awesome about this country is all you have or have to do is wait. Exactly. It's literally that simple. Things do pitch back and forth and focus shifts on issues. I get that. But man, for these guys to take all those steps. Uh, and you do wonder about the group dynamics, you know, the leader, how he's influencing his friends, um, how much of, of that can be looked at and analyzed as well. I mean, it would have been really interesting to hear tapes of some of these conversations that they're having at the at the Waffle House, you know. Oh, I know. Um, and, you know, I think too, I think that's a lot where age kind of starts to come into this right. because a lot of people do have time to wait, but maybe they thought they didn't. And maybe they felt they had to leave their mark before they left. And then, yeah. you know, unfortunately, I've actually covered a lot of cases like this on my personal channel lately where people will take age and assume things are jokes because of that. So there could right. have been a lot of people at Waffle House that heard them talking about these things and they did exactly what their lawyer claimed they were just, you know, old people talking crap about the government because that's typical. And there's just this stereotype behind elderly that, again, they're harmless and you're supposed to almost like pity them and they're incapable. There's just this giant mindset behind it. Um, and I found it interesting how that kind of played directly into this particular scenario that they knew that and they were comfortable because of that talking about it publicly. Right. In a Waffle House. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's wild. <laughs> it is. Wow. Yeah, you brought a good one. That's for sure. Man, that is just, it's it's mind blowing. It's like domestic terrorism. And the fact that, ah, I don't know. 70 and 80 year olds. It's people, someone you wouldn't necessarily expect. It's, yeah. It makes you wonder, like, were they feeling mm -hmm. like they really hadn't left their mark on the world or, you know, they're getting towards the end of their life and they feel incomplete in some way. And that's why they're looking to make this big push to prove yeah. to themselves that they were right about something the whole time. I don't know. Yeah. I'm sure you can get a, a psychologist looking at this and go for hours on it. Wow. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Wow. Good job, Danielle. That is uh, really <laughs> interesting. And it, it kind of hits on some of the points we were talking about with that top five list, especially exactly. harassment. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and getting opinionated and more vocal as you get older. Oh, all right. Well, I got my work cut out for me, that's for sure. Let me take a sip <laughs> real quick. I told you, I brought it today. You sure did. Last time I go winning three in a row. <laughs> <laughs> See what happens. <laughs> I get crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see. Your group of old men versus my story about one woman. Oh, boy. Let's do it. All right. Business Insider says factors such as inadequate retirement savings and the increased cost of medical care and food can attract a senior citizen to crime. You also have some older people feeling disconnected from society. Hmm, kind of like in Danielle's story, mm -hmm. uh, leading to animosity towards others, depression, and antisocial behavior. A lot of those actually tie to your story. All of those conditions can lead someone to a life of crime. Even simple boredom comes into play for our elderly citizens. But in the case of Sigun Liebhart and a crime that she committed in Glastonbury, a town of about 35,000 people located on the banks of the Connecticut River in Hartford County, Connecticut, I don't think boredom was her motivating factor. The Daily Mail refers to Seagun Liebhart as a septuagenarian hooker. Oh, boy. That's right. A prostitute oh boy. in her 70s. I don't think I've ever heard anything like that before. Well, buckle up. You're going to hear more about her. <laughs> oh, no. January 2013. At 71 years old, Seagun called herself Lola or Catherine on different websites advertising escort services. On some posts, <laughs> I'm just shocked that Daniel, Danielle's eyes are just giant right now. <laughs> <laughs> 
Interesting. <laughs> yeah, they're going to get bigger. Uh, on some posts, she would fudge her age a little bit, saying she was even as young as 60. One post read, A truly mature escort with over 25 years experience in delivering a symphony of luxury and sensual delight to discriminating professional gentlemen, both younger and older, who can afford the best and who prefer their women a bit older, but a lot better. Oh my, well, that's confidence right there. Yeah. That's some serious confidence. Yeah, she should get into marketing YouTube channels. <laughs> I think I'd hire her. Uh, my background is French and German mix with soft, beautiful skin, perfectly groomed from head to toe. Fine lingerie is a must to complete this picture of sensuous refinement and elegance. Savor the charms of maturity and submit yourself to sensuous abandon in the arms of a genuine cougar. <laughs> <laughs> can sell it. Oh, she sure can, man. That's Woo. hilarious. Yeah. Wide away with words. Yeah. Sensuous abandon. I got I to gotta remember some of these. Keep these I'm... written down for anniversary cards and Valentine's Day cards for my wife. If um, I ever said anything like that to my husband, he'd be like, you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> something wrong. Yeah. I guess as you get older, your vocabulary gets better. Uh, Lola also had an ad on the somewhat infamous website Backpage.com. Her post there read, older is better, a well-preserved beauty, all natural and busty, 38 double D, <laughs> <laughs> sexy, fit, warm, and friendly. She also referred to herself as the perfect pleasure and adventure behind closed doors. That sounds like a, a odd title for a book. <laughs> <laughs> really? The perfect pleasure? <laughs> <laughs> An adventure behind closed doors. Yeah, dun, like, dun, a, dun. like a paperback you'd buy in a supermarket. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Lola was charging about half of what other escorts on those sites were. Her back page ad said she was visiting Glastonbury in Connecticut for only three days and a phone for a quick response. She specifically said she doesn't like to communicate via text or email. Unfortunately for Lola, someone at the Glastonbury Police Department saw her ad and set up a sting operation. They contacted her and agreed to meet at her hotel room. Once a deal was struck between Lola and the undercover officer, she was arrested on a single count of prostitution, a misdemeanor. Yeah. Now, uh, Seagun was granted a $500 non-surety bond, which I actually had to look up. I wasn't sure what that was. I'm it's not a, sure what that is either. Yeah, it's a bond where you don't post any money up front to be released from jail, but you do agree to show up to court. And then if you don't show up, a warrant will be issued and the amount that it was written for becomes due from you personally. At that point, it's not like you can go and get a bail yeah. and you know okay. pay 10% to a bail bondsman. You will actually just have to pay the full amount at that point. Okay. Uh, in an interview in February 2013, Seagun, mm -hmm. who actually lives in nearby Westport, Connecticut, said she sporadically accepts money to be a companion, but no sex is involved. She claims that the undercover officer who arrested her misinterpreted what she was accepting money for. She said she only intended to go out to dinner. Um, <laughs> yeah, we... I heard part of her ads. I don't know if any of that involves dinner. <laughs> That's why I wanted to include her ads. And of course, <laughs> yeah, I have to admit there's a little bit of a fun aspect in terms of hearing an ad like that, but it really does tie in when... <laughs> Hi, you want to go to dinner? Here's my bra size. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, yeah, I don't think, uh, what was that term that I was saying I need to remember? Well, uh, the adventure behind closed doors. Yeah, that's not really. Uh, oh, yeah. serious, uh, sensuous abandon. Yeah, I don't know if that's talking about dinner. <laughs> uh, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when she heard what the officer quoted her as saying, she stated, I was dumbfounded. I never uttered any of those words. Despite mm. Seagun uh, disputing the prostitution charge in her comments, in court, her and her attorney, Tony Anthony, would apply for an accelerated rehabilitation program available to first-time offenders of nonviolent crimes. The program would place her on probation for two years, and if she successfully completes the program, she'll serve no further j time in jail, and the prostitution charge against her would be dismissed." I was kind of interested that this was her first charge because if what she's telling us in her post is true, 
she's been doing this for 25 years. Oh, exactly. Yeah. So apparently this is the first time she got busted. Man, she made it a long time. Yeah. Segan, <laughs> yeah, she sure did. Uh, Segan received some unwanted attention for her arrest, including becoming a joke for Jay Leno on The Tonight Show and having her story appear on hundreds of websites. Uh, and I just have to stop and tell you, there was no way to finish the research on this case. I was going through page after page after page of results. And then all of a sudden I was getting into uh, different languages and I could see that it was still about her. It was still about Are the same serious? topic. Oh, wow. It just, everybody wrote a, a, about this. It just ripped across the internet. Uh, however, there's a bit of a more serious twist to all this. Uh, Segan has stated that she cannot get a more traditional job because of her age and a health problem. So she didn't really go into the health problem, but, uh, and I know that we've heard about seniors having trouble uh, finding work. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that's even when you have job experience that might apply. Here we're talking about someone that has likely been working as a prostitute for 25 years. I mean, what is she, how is she going to translate that? I, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. And usually they're going to want to accept someone younger anyways, because they're able to have that person around longer. So yeah, right. that can be difficult. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she started a blog in February of 2013, a blog that to this day still only has two posts, both of them about what she was going through at the time of the arrest. So this is a quote from the first post. My arrest for prostitution last week on Friday, January 25th, 2013 in Glastonbury, Connecticut shook me to my core. My mother used to say when things are dark that there is always a silver lining in the cloud. This is becoming more and more apparent to me in my current life situation. The positive outpouring of support for me worldwide has simply amazed me and gave me some hope to face the struggle that lies in front of me. But it also saddens me deeply to realize how many people live in fear, judgment, and hate toward their fellow human beings. I plan to use this opportunity to change the direction of my life and to continue to be a positive influence in the world. A few that days. makes me sad. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how I felt about it too. And I'm curious when she's talking about the challenge that's ahead of her. <clears throat> yeah, if she's talking about trying to go legit, you know, trying to exactly. get a, a job where she's not doing this. Um, a few days later, she made another post and it was titled The Way Forward. Near the top in bold letters was a statement with five exclamation points. You simply cannot be everything to all people. The past is the past. I can't change it, only learn from it. People can judge me. Sticks and stones won't hurt my bones. Years of personal experience in my marriages and long-term relationships gave me the opportunity to gather a cornucopia of immense knowledge that led to my better understanding of the female and male physiology. I will begin an advice column on my website in the very near future. Well, there we go. Yeah. And I'm kind of bummed that it didn't pan out. Uh, at yeah. least, you know, the, this is literally about all that's written on the blog. Um, but the statement she makes at the top about you simply cannot be everything to all people, uh, especially when you're talking about people that are in the field of sex workers or prostitution yeah. in particular, really, really hit me. Um, yeah. And I did some additional research we're going to get to by the end of this that kind of ties back to that. Uh, she reportedly moved out of the Connecticut area and now resides with a friend in Manhattan. But for women that want to move forward from prostitution, how exactly do you do that, especially later in life? Bethany St. James wrote a piece for the Huffington Post called Life After Prostitution, and it echoes a lot of the sentiment in Segan's blog posts, a desire to move forward, to learn from mistakes, that you can't just be there for the enjoyment of others. Bethany also opens up about her struggles, including a diagnosis of PTSD resulting from her career choice and her perspective on what's truly important. And here's a quote from Bethany. The point is that I made it through. I did the work. I allowed myself to process, to heal, and to understand the oddity that is my life. I learned I'm a lot more than someone else's entertainment. I have learned how to live with complex PTSD and the stigma surrounding those of us that made the choice to work and live within the confines of the adult entertainment business as a way of filling the voids. 
I can say with outright certainty that without a greater understanding of who we are and without examining our reasons for doing what we do, we tend to get stuck in a place disguised as comfort. Now that I've reclaimed my life and redirected my career, I can tell you that from where I sit, I am really enjoying being a little uncomfortable now and again. And it's a place I highly recommend spending some time in. Uh, I don't believe it's ever too late to learn, learn and change. And I truly hope Seagun, who is now nearing 80 years young, feels the same way too. Wow. <clears throat> See, to me, that's so unbelievable because you do not, you'd never see situations like that. It's very rare for someone of that age to be in that situation because right. normally, normally people that are in that line of work, and I don't want to, you know, stereotype, generalize, it's because they can't do anything else. You know, they're having, or not can't, but they, they're struggling to find another job. Or they're, they don't believe in themselves enough. Exactly. Or they There's they a, have financial concerns <clears throat> where the yeah. easy money is, Yeah. There's a lot of usually, usually there's a lot of personal issues going along with it of some sort. And it's right. very interesting to see someone of that age kind of go into that. Um, I don't know. That's insane. And it makes me feel sad for her <laughs> um, because she was arrested for it. Obviously, you know, it, it is a crime, but it, <laughs> I'm thankful that the process didn't hit her too hard though, that they oh, have this, you know, they yeah. have this option. We're just going to put you on probation for a couple years. As long as you don't, you know, get in trouble again, this whole charge is going to go away. So it's not like on a job application, she's going to have to put, oh yeah, I've got a, you know, prostitution charge. I mean, it, so at least the system didn't take a bad situation and make it make worse. Make it worse. Exactly. I almost wish though, I almost wish she would have shared more about why. Yeah. Um, and, the, you know, I understand, obviously, why she denied a lot. Um, I completely get it. And there is so much judgment out there, uh, especially to the sex work industry. But I almost wish I could know. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. I feel like there's so much to learn from that. Yes. There's a value in sharing that with other people, too, so that they can understand that um, and, and watch for that in their own lives as well. I was trying to hit another angle on this story about how how do you retire from prostitution? Because I'm wondering how many people are like her that are, you know, have been exactly. doing this for decades and then all of a sudden, hey, I'm in my 60s or I'm in my 70s. What do I do at this point? It's not like there's a 401k yeah. that I yeah. have to fall back on. There's no retirement plan from this. And it, it kind of made me sad. I couldn't find great information about what happens there. Um, yeah, I feel like it ends up just being one of those cycles that uh, a lot of people just don't get out of. And there really isn't a light at the end of the tunnel for most circumstances. And I mean, imagine that you start off at a place where you maybe can't further what you're doing or yourself or progress, whether it's within your own life or within your career. And so you do this because this is great and it's fast money and it's, it's, you know, it can be fun. And, right. but then you end up right back where you started. Yeah. If you do continue this for decades and then I can only imagine how helpless you would feel then because you know, you've done this for decades now and now you're just back to where you started. It's not like you're, like you said, you're not retiring with any sort of retirement saved up for you or, you know, monthly checks that are going to be sent to you for this. And yeah. whoo, wow. Yeah. I almost hope that there is like a support group or something mm -hmm. that she's able to find um, of, of, you know, former sex workers and that they're able to share information about how they were able to move out of that industry. I, I can't imagine it's easy. And you go from, you know, it, it seems kind of glamorized. Like there's even, oh uh, yeah, I've seen photos of, that she would accompany with her postings and it's, it's very glamorous. You know, she's dressing in this kind of over the top lingerie and there's ruffles and feathers and it just, how do you go from that to, oh, I'm going to be standing at the front of the Walmart saying, you know, hi to people as they come yeah. in. Uh, or, or, you know, I'm going to be stocking shelves or I'm going to be, you know, pricing things. It's just, I don't know. I don't know how you shift at that point. Um, but And then especially at that age too. It's just like it, 
I mean, when you're younger, obviously I see more of a, a chance that you can probably get out and do something else. But when you're been, you've been stuck in that for a very long time. And then again, like she was saying, you know, there might not be other things you can do at that age. You might not have many offers for jobs. People don't want, right. you know, to keep you around cause you might not be around for very long and that doesn't benefit their business model. And yep. man, it's yep. almost like there's, I hate to use this term, <laughs> but it's almost like those crimes of necessity that you see, like almost right. how we talked about, you know, when we did, um, you know, the man that I spoke about that, you know, committed all those crimes and robbed all those groceries. Uh, the crime in the name of people. good episode. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, uh, there. It's this is like a whole other angle of a crime that's being committed because there might not be any other choice. Right. How's she going to take care for of survival? Herself? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Man. Yeah. No, that's sad. Wow. Yeah, I really feel for her. And I tried to find more information, but um, she pretty much bowed out of the public eye after that immediate run. And there was some very nice comments that people had left on her, uh, on the two blog posts. There was also some that were kind of creepy, but, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, guys, guys can uh, be guys at the most yeah. inappropriate times. Let me just say that. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Hold on, hold on a second. We are interrupting this episode with a very special announcement. Crime After Crime has just been confirmed to appear at CrimeCon, and we want you to be there. Use our coupon code CRIMEAFTERCRIME19 while registering for CrimeCon 2019 at www.crimecon.com, and you will get 10% off the standard badge. That's going to save you over 35 bucks. But there's more, John. Huh? Use that code, come meet us, and you will get all Lord and Arts and Daniel Holland giveaway items, including the super rare and highly discussed brain scratch pen that was a big hit last year that my husband stole from me. <laughs> I might give Danielle another brain scratch <laughs> pen, but I only have a certain number left. And yes, we will be blowing those out for you, our closest of fans. But on top of that, we've got a brand new design that we're doing for this year. The brand new limited edition crime after crime stress ball, which is actually shaped like a police car. It's got a crime after crime logo on the hood. And if you really want, I think you can get Danielle and myself to sign the doors. But... There's still more, John. The first 10 people to use the coupon code CRIMEAFTERCRIME19 will get all of that stuff plus a Crime After Crime t-shirt. Well, where am I going to wear that t-shirt, Danielle? Oh, I've got plans. You will need to wear that shirt as entry to our very first official Crime After Crime meetup drink up. That's right. Come and have a beer with us or a soda if you don't drink. The first round is on us. We can chat about cases, life, whatever. The 12 of us will be hanging out together for an hour at some fun location in New Orleans. And that sounds like a good time to me. Sure does. You have to register at www.crimecon.com by May 2nd. CrimeCon 2019 takes place in New Orleans, Louisiana, June 7th through the 9th at the Hilton Riverside. Be sure to select standard badge, then go down to the coupon or voucher code field, enter in crime after crime 19 and hit apply for your discount. But standard crime con tickets do sell out. Happened last year. Don't wait until it's too late. Don't miss out on this chance to meet us both. If you want to make sure that you are eligible to be one of the first 10 before you register, all you have to do is follow and visit our Twitter account at CrimeAfterPod, and if you see this video pinned, then you are still in. Otherwise, we will pin a message saying the first 10 have been booked, but you can still use the code, still get the discount, still get all the limited edition stuff, and still come meet us at the con. We will also make an announcement on the community tab of the Crime After Crime YouTube page when the first 10 is completely sold out. Remember, to get in on this, you have to be sure to register for CrimeCon 2019 at www.crimecon.com. Make sure you use that coupon code CrimeAfterCrime19 when checking out. And then all you have to do is email us at CrimeAfterCrime at Lord and Arts, that is spelled L O R D A N. A-R-T-S dot com with first 10 in the subject line and tell us what size t-shirt to get you. And they will be standard unisex shirt sizes. So just keep that in mind when you let us know. Then get to New Orleans and get ready for the best crime conference going and get ready to meet us. We hope to see you guys there. 
So yes. what about other cases, Danielle? Did <clears throat> you bump into anything else while doing your research for this? Oh, boy. Well, um, I can definitely say this is probably one of, if not my favorite topic that we've looked into so far, just because it's so fascinating to me. Yeah. Because I already feel like there's this, you know, we already try to understand why people commit the crimes that they do. But then, like I was saying, there is the stigma that goes along with the elderly, and it makes it that much more unbelievable. Um, so this one was wild. And this one's definitely on the darker side, just warning you, but okay. it's something that is, so, it's just unbelievable to me. And I actually found multiple instances like this. So in 2018 in Port Orange, Florida, an 81 year old man approached a mom and her eight year old daughter sitting on a bench in Walmart. And as a mother, usually when that happens, again, you're kind of more trusting. It's like a grandparent. And usually sure. they come and they approach you about, oh, when my kids were this young and oh, why does not that kid have socks on? And are you <laughs> You being nice to your parents? Are you respectful? But no, this man bluntly offers the mother two hundred thousand dollars for her daughter. What? Yes, just Creep. in a Walmart, just walks up, older man, eighty-one years old. Wow. And when they got up to run from this man, he actually grabbed the eight-year-old and kissed her on the hand. Oh my God, it's worse than I thought. Oh yeah. Because I, I, I originally had this thought. Well, maybe this is kind of his way of adopting in some weird way, but I nope. didn't want to go to the dark place. And he nope. Did. <laughs> yeah. And authorities actually were able to track him down from security cameras and credit card transactions. And after it was publicly announced that this was happening, more people came forward claiming they had the exact same experience with him offering $200,000 for them to give over their daughters. That is ridiculous. And like, I already cannot understand why some criminals commit the crimes they do, but yeah, this one, and I'm like, does he just genuinely not care from his old age? He just doesn't care. He just right, he's right. going to walk up to anyone in Walmart. It's yeah, ee, unbelievable. Did he if wind I, up in jail? Oh yeah. He was arrested. Oh yeah. yeah. He was, he was done for, mm -hmm. but. I wonder if he's got a cellmate that's kissing his hand. <laughs> Uh, honestly, it might be a possibility. Yeah, man. Uh, well, I got one for you. This one took place in 2009 in Nigeria. The National Drug Law Enforcement Agency said it had found 254 sacks of cannabis at the home of Suleiman Adebayo, amounting to about 6.5 tons of marijuana. Adebayo, who was a farmer his entire life, told authorities he thought it was rice in the sacks and that he was 114 years old. Now there's oh, no <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. Now there's no confirmation on his age, but I'm pretty sure he might have been living on a high diet of the rice in his sacks for a very long time, but Oh, absolutely. Yeah, probably not 114 years. <laughs> no. Oh my gosh. Well, since you did a funny one, I have to do one. And I didn't, I found actually two really great funny ones. Uh -oh. um, but this one was just unbelievable to me. So a 74 year old man was arrested for what is known as the Kardashian book massacre. And yes, you heard, you heard that right. <laughs> so this man, 74 year old, went into a bookstore and poured red liquid over Kim Kardashian's book that's called Selfish. And then he even had typed out a lengthy note that explained exactly why he hated Kim Kardashian and people just like her and left it with these books that he had destroyed. Um, yeah, he ended up being arrested for criminal mischief in the third degree, but he still stood by his actions. Wow. Well, it's almost like a protest, I guess, but that's a really weird... <laughs> I mean, he just poured random red liquid all over it. And then, I mean, but it's a very, to me, it's a very typical elderly thing to do to then type out your explanation as to why and leave it. Yeah. You know, it almost <laughs> reminds me of like when someone would throw paint on someone's fur coat or something like that in a form oh, of yeah. protest, but protesting oh, the Kardashians. Oh, yeah. Okay. He was mad. He did not like her. I guess not. Uh, 2009, San Diego, California. 73-year-old Virginia Kelly was the president of the Latino Foster Parents Association. She seemed well suited to it considering she was caring for four foster children and had cared for more than 2,000 over her life. Wow. Virginia collected toys for charities like Toys for Tots and the Child Abuse Foundation, or at least that's what people thought. Apparently, she was selling the toys that were donated to her for personal profit. Investigators seized more than 11,000 toys from her possession and estimate that in total, she stole approximately $200,000, there's that number again, 
from the wow. charity organizations. Virginia said she was just collecting the toys uh, faster than she could find needy children to take them. Well, that's a load of crap. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it didn't it didn't hold up in court too well either. Uh, she was convicted of grand theft and sentenced to 60 days in jail, followed by 120 more days of home confinement. Wow. That's kind of that's that's pretty low. Yeah. That's yeah, pretty low. It is. 11,000 toys, man. She must have yeah. had some big toy drives and then to not turn that stuff. How do you not turn that stuff I know. over? Yeah, I don't get that, especially when you know how much of a need there is there. Seriously. That's so disappointing. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to fit in one more because it's it was too funny to yep. not include. You got it. And it's unbelievable. So Alexander and Christine Clement from Long Island were charged with five counts of petty larceny and five counts of tampering with consumer products. These people would go and buy pudding packets and they would bring them home, I saw remove the pudding, yeah, and then replace it with aquarium sand and return it to the store. Yeah. And obviously, other people are buying these pudding packets, and they're clearly going to be disappointed when it turns out to be sand. Right. So obviously, these people were found, and they were arrested and charged. But I mean, really? I mean, it takes more effort to replace these packets with sand and then return them to the store than it would take for you to probably go ask someone and be like, hey, I really want some pudding. Can I have a few dollars? <laughs> um, now, I haven't bought pudding. Have you bought pudding recently? I haven't bought pudding in a long time. Um, a while ago, like the single boxes. I'm right. pretty sure they're only like two something. That's or what three I'm talking something. about. Yeah. So oh. how much are you saving by doing all this? You're going to the store. You're taking the pudding packet. You're driving you're buy, home. You have to buy aquarium sand. And I'm sure that's exactly. just not cheap. <laughs> aquarium sand. Plus you need a good knife for it so that you cut the bag yeah. the right way so you could refill it and not damage the box and all. And then you have to drive it back. So you've got gas. You've got time invested. Maybe this is one of those board. Maybe this falls under the board category because honestly, <laughs> I cannot see how it would, would how it would help them financially no. or <sighs> what is the motivation there? That's insane. <laughs> I have no idea. Wow. But someone loves pudding, that's for sure. I love pudding, but I would never do that for it. <laughs> All right, Danielle, who's going to win this month? I don't know. I feel like we bought, brought two very, very different cases, which actually typically doesn't happen. Yeah. Normally we end up kind of like on the same wavelength. And to me, they're both so unbelievable in very, very different ways. Like mine was kind of unbelievable in the sense of you would never expect four elderly people to genuinely try to overtake the government, right. something in, in a very physical way too, as well. Like they, they were planning on using bombs and the poison, but they were plan they bought guns. They were planning to go in. Yeah. I mean, and if they could not walk very well, according to a lot of the articles that I've seen, unbelievable. And in a uh, waffle house, <laughs> you know, very, very obviously talking about this. Yeah. Have your meeting somewhere private guys. If you really I want mean, to be the, the new version of the minute man, don't do it at the waffle house. And then just how extreme it was. I mean, it was extreme. So to me, yeah. that's unbelievable. But then yeah. yours as well. I mean, I never, I don't think, obviously I, I don't know a lot about sex work. That's not something that I've ever been involved in or have really looked much into, but I mean, I know there are people out there who love an 80 year old woman, sure. but I don't, but I don't, I don't know. It's unbelievable to me that that is, you know, what she wanted to be in, man. And she was selling it. I'm also, and she was going for it. It's kind of unbelievable that they would even do the sting operation. Exactly. <laughs> and that was the next thing that I was about to go into is, I mean, I'm sure there were many other people that probably were being so much more of a threat possibly or causing problems. Yeah. And the fact that they chose to go over, you know, an 80 year old woman. But maybe they helped her. I mean, you know what? I think in the end they did, but I don't think there was any way they could have possibly assumed they could help her. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you're worried about, you know, these things can turn bad. She yeah. meets some creep and, you know, sh she winds up dead somewhere. So um, I don't know. She's older. She probably couldn't have defended herself very well. So that is yeah. a good point put into it. I feel like their heart was in the right place. Mm -hmm. I don't, uh, in particular with the court system, I just, I feel like that 
piece yeah. went really well, but I'm not sure about the initial sting operation. Couldn't they have just like, you know, gotten in touch with her and just not even put her through the whole thing and just been like, look, what are you doing? Just the, we need to help you not do this. Yeah. You know? But, you know, at the same time, I think it's one of those fine lines where people, you know, are worried to treat some criminals different than others. And that's where age, again, plays a huge factor. It's like how, you know, a lot of the youth even, they're easily dismissed from crimes that if they had just been two years older, might not have gone the way that they thought. And then the same thing with the elderly. So it's it's yeah. interesting. It's very interesting to see the difference. So the point I was talking about handled. earlier, sometimes you have to take their license away. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Maybe Lola's license should have been revoked. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> All right. So our next episode was suggested by Danny. Thank you so much, Danny. On the next episode of Crime After Crime, we are going to be covering the worst alibi. Mm, this should be interesting. Yes. Yes. I want to. And we we chatted a little bit, but I don't know where you're at with it. So does it have to be an alibi where the person was convicted or does it have to be an alibi that got them off that is just ridiculous? What What are your feelings on that? I say we do an alibi that just didn't work out. So they ended up getting convicted anyways because of their ridiculous alibi. That will certainly open up how ridiculous <laughs> they can be, I think. Um, because people say and do some crazy things. And I mean, I personally don't think I've actually ever covered anything, though, where I've seen someone use a horrible alibi. Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be a good research job because I really can't think of one off the top of my head. Uh, I know motives. I've certainly covered yeah. some interesting motives. But for alibis, yeah, we're going to have to do some digging on that one, I think. Oh, Yeah. And oh, yeah. in the spot where we're usually talking about other podcasts you guys can listen to, I'm going to do another shameless plug, just like I did on the last episode, I think. <laughs> this this segment is now John's shameless plugs. Um, I'm only making two appearances this year. One of them is at CrimeCon, where I'll be there with my partner in Crime After Crime, Danielle. And another one is coming up in April. I just want to let you guys know about it and suggest a podcast all in one one little package here for you. <laughs> you can meet me at the American Investigative Society's Cold Case Conference, and I'll be there with Tim and Lance from Crawl Space, which is the podcast. If you haven't checked out Crawl Space, you really should. Tim and Lance pretty much came into the podcast area and gained their notoriety with the Missing Maura Murray podcast. Crawl Space is their other project where they cover all kinds of different topics. I've been on there a bunch of times. Uh, also with Tim and Lance at the Cold Case Conference and myself will be Mike Morford, who is one of my co-hosts on Three Men in a Mystery. And we're going to be doing a panel there talking about how social media can help with cold cases. On top of that, there's other people that are going to be there. Aphrodite Jones, Dr. Cyril Weck, Dr. Henry Lee. It takes place April 14th, or I'm sorry, April 15th and 16th in Albany, New York. You can learn more or register now at www.aisocc.com. The registration deadline is April 2nd. So if you want to come, don't miss out. And then if you guys want to see more of John and I outside of the podcast, we both have separate YouTube channels and there's also a YouTube channel for this podcast. So if you want to see video form, you can see that at crime after crime. You can search that on YouTube or you can find my channel. Just type up Danielle Hallen. Or you can find me Lord and Arts, L-O-R-D-A-N-A-R-T-S. And then we both also have social media. I'm pretty active on Twitter, and so is John. You can find me again at just Danielle Hallen. And I am at Lord and Arts. And yeah, it's pretty easy to get in touch with us on Twitter in particular. Uh, really quick and easy way to get in contact with me in particular. Uh, to submit ideas on crime for Crime After Crime for future episodes or to let us know how we're doing, whatever, you can email crimeaftercrime at lordandarts.com or visit us on Twitter at crimeafterpod. Crime After Crime is produced and hosted by Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. And we want to say a special thank you to our patrons. You guys make sure we have limited ads on YouTube and no ads on audio, which makes the experience awesome for you guys. Plus, we also do a bonus Patreon special segment monthly where you get to really learn a lot about John and I. We talk about a lot of awesome, interesting subjects, a lot behind the scenes. And once you sign up to be a Patreon, we give you a personal shout out 
every single special. Yep. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. We still need help growing and we cannot do that without you. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone about Crime After Crime. And we also want to remind you guys that our merch store is still up and running. If you guys want to get your own coffee mug or shirt or bag, you guys can go to teespring.com forward slash stores forward slash crime after crime. That's it for this monthly episode, you guys. We'll see you next time on Crime After Crime. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.